Welcome to the Real Lost Boss podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 20 of the Real Lost Boss podcast. Let's try and sort that emotional eating. Yes, it's a biggie. It is a biggie and it's probably, if I'm being honest, the biggest thing I did on my weight loss journey. And I fully believe if I'd not got on top of my emotional eating, I certainly wouldn't have lost the weight I've lost and I certainly would not have maintained those losses for over six years now. And yeah, it's massive. It really, really is. Uh, And I feel with emotional eating, it's probably the biggest reason why people have a severe weight issue. Okay, so if I asked, you know, anyone, why are you overweight? Why do you have this weight issue? A lot of people's response will be, I eat too much, I eat the wrong things, maybe I'm a little bit lazy. I'm not saying those are not contributing factors to a weight issue, but I didn't get to being 37 stone because I had poor portion control or I was a little bit of a lazy bum. I didn't. I got to be in 37 stone because I consistently overate food. Why did I consistently overeat food? I ate whether I was hungry or not. It was just a constant in my life. And that was because I used food as my coping mechanism to get through life. And that is what emotional eating is. It's using food to, yeah, to cope. It can either be a distraction, it can be the only thing that brings you a little bit of enjoyment, it can be, you know, a fail safe, it can be a best friend at times, but it's also your worst enemy. And yeah, it's what I used to get through life. And some people use drugs, some people use alcohol, some people use gambling, whatever your crux is. Um, Mine was food. And I don't believe that people, and I might be wrong on this, you might disagree with me, but I don't believe people have a a serious weight issue unless emotional eating is playing a major role in their life. So I always grade weight issues. I don't mean I grade them. I don't mean I have like grade A to C or something like that. But the bigger the weight issue, the bigger the issue. Does that kind of make sense? So what I mean by that is, you know, if someone comes to me and they're uh, a couple of stone overweight or someone comes to me and they're 20 stone overweight, the person that's 20 stone overweight certainly has bigger issues to tackle than someone that's two stone overweight. Now, your weight issue is always subjective to you. And I'm not saying that if you are just a stone or two overweight, that, you know, you don't have an issue or a big issue in your mind. But what I mean is, I'm trying to sort of say, you know, me at 37 stone, my ideal weight's probably, whatever, according to the BMI scale, and I hate the BMI scale, it's a load of nonsense to be honest with you, but according to the BMI scale, my my, my ideal weight's probably 14 stone, which means I am, you know, 23 stone overweight. I certainly have a more severe weight issue than someone who's, 13 stone and according to the BMI scale they should be 11 right now like I say issues are always subjective to the individual so I'm not saying that all weight issues aren't important and that's something I've actually changed in my own mindset I was very much um and it was wrong of me if I'm being honest with you when you know people would come to me and they'd ask me for advice on weight loss And literally, when I looked at them, I was like, you're not even overweight. Why are you bothered about losing weight? I'd never say that to them, but that's kind of what I was thinking. But I've learned a lot over the years. I've learned a lot from being a personal trainer. I've learned a lot from being uh, an online weight loss coach. Uh, And it's wrong of me to, just because I might not class it as being quite a big issue, doesn't mean that the individual doesn't class it as being a big issue. But like I say, I just think when we look at how much, people are overweight and how much weight they've got to lose and whether they are just overweight, obese or morbidly obese like I was, yeah, we have to accept that people that are heavier, that are certainly like I was, morbidly obese, they have bigger issues at hand. And, you know, someone that is a stone or two overweight, it could be because they have poor portion control 
or because they are a little bit lazy. Someone like me that's 20 stone overweight, like I say, you don't get to be in that size because you have poor portion control or you're a bit, a bit lazy. It's because, you know, you use this food as a constant. And, you know, when I look back over my life, it, it's sometimes a hard thing to accept, but it's, but it's right, you know. When I had days where I was lonely, I'd eat. Where I had days where I was bored, I'd eat. If I had days where I was stressed, I'd eat. And those emotions that I'm talking about there, stress, boredom, uh, loneliness, they're all negative emotions. And this is what we need to understand. Sometimes, you know, I talk to clients, I talk to, when I was a personal trainer, obviously working one-to-one -one with people, and people would say to me, you know, yeah, I just overeat all the time. I overeat when I'm happy. I'm, o I'm overeating when I'm sad. I'm like, you don't overeat when you're happy. No one does that. Don't get me wrong. When it's your birthday, you, you're you happy because it's your birthday and you're celebrating. And I'm not saying you don't go for a slap up meal, but you don't constantly overeat because you're happy. Likewise, you might love Christmas Day. And on Christmas Day, everyone's eating Pringles and turkey and pigs in blankets and cheese boards are out and tubs of chockies are out. Again, it's a happy time for most people, but it's just a single day. You don't consistently overeat because you're happy. You consistently overeat. Emotional eating is triggered because you're unhappy. And, you know, <sighs> Any negative emotion that you might be going through, and you might be going through several negative emotions, will trigger overeating. You'll trigger that coping mechanism that's required. And like I say, you know, because you're lonely, you eat. And that food at the time becomes your friend. Because you're angry, you eat. Because that food at the time actually makes you happy. Um, and any negative emotion can trigger emotional eating. It doesn't have to be, you know, I think when people think of negative emotion or they think of low mood, they might just think of depression or anxiety. It's not, you know, things that go on in your body and in your mind that are negative, it could be tiredness. It could be loneliness. It could be fear. It could be anger. Um, it could be um, jealousy. Yeah. It could be boredom. All these things are emotions that we don't want to feel. I don't want to feel angry. I don't want to feel stressed. I don't want to feel lonely. I don't want to live in fear. I don't want to feel anxious. So these are the emotions, negative emotions, that make you turn to that coping mechanism. And it might just be for 30 seconds. It might be for five minutes. It might be for half an hour. It might be for a few hours. When you use that coping me mechanism, it's a distraction. It takes you away from that overriding feeling that you have. So we need to stop saying that we overeat all the time. I overeat because I'm happy. I overeat. You don't. I'm not saying, again, you don't have poor portion control on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not saying, you know, that. Um, but stop demonizing yourself or bringing yourself down because like I say, you go out for a slap up meal on your birthday, you enjoy Christmas or, you know, when you go all inclusive for a week to Tenerife, you, you have a right knees up. You should do. That's called life. And we should enjoy life even when we're on a weight loss journey. So if it's these negative emotions that trigger emotional eating, what is the cure? Well, the cure is to get rid of those negative emotions, but it isn't that easy. And you can't eradicate negative emotion. There's a few different levels to sorting emotional eating out. So I'm going to revert, and this might, you know, resonate with you. It might not. Like I say, different people have different issues. But from working with a lot of clients, talking to a lot of people, generally, the feeling or the need to use any sort of coping mechanism, you can generally pinpoint it back to a single point in time. And then once that coping mechanism has been used once or twice, or it then becomes your regular, you'll use it for everything. 
So like I say, I'm not saying this is relevant to everyone, but I'm going to talk about me. And this is what I sort of did to kind of start the healing process of my emotional eating. And my, it's quite hard for me to, it's not hard for me to talk about. I'm not a massive emotional person, if I'm honest with you, but I can get emotional. So if I do, I might stop the podcast, but I shouldn't do. Um, my emotional eating, when I sort of started to, to sort of dissect it in my mind and I looked for that first original trigger point, it was when I was a kid and I'd be about eight or nine years of age. And I had quite a difficult relationship with my dad. It wasn't a, like a, a bad relationship as such, but my dad was adopted. And from being adopted, he felt permanently rejected by obviously his biological parents. And it just so happens that his adoptive parents weren't the nicest people either. So he kind of felt rejected by them as well. The knock-on effect of that with my dad was he had a lot of mental health issues. He was bipolar type two. And he really struggled. I, you know, I can't say I ever, you know, talked to him deeply about this because he just wasn't that sort of person. But I know just from here, overhearing him as a kid talking to my mum and stuff, I know he contemplated suicide a couple of times. I know he was on and off medication. I don't know what medications he was on and off. Uh, but I know... Like I say, for most of his life, he really did suffer with with mental health, with his mental health, uh, and the knock on effect of that and feeling rejected was he never showed love, or he struggled to show love. Certainly to me, that's how I felt. Yeah. Now again, opening up, um, I do have a sister. Um, kind of disowned from my sister. Again, I don't mind being honest with you guys. I'll always try and be as honest as I can in these podcasts. I've not spoke to her for years and years and years. Um, and, and I always felt like I was second fiddle to her. And I was, you know, I'll be honest with you. And um, again, as a kid, you don't really understand these emotions. You don't really understand what's going on. But like I say, I just never felt loved from my dad. I felt love from my mum and I'm not saying I had a bad childhood or anything like that but it was something I struggled with and my dad used to go to therapy and one day I was in his office and I was um, on his computer uh, we had a I'm, and I'm talking like late 80s it was an old Amstrad computer and it had a few games on it so that's what introduced me to computer games. Um, and I was playing it. And I don't know why. I think I was looking for another game that we had. And if anyone remembers these, this is showing my age. This computer had five and a half inch floppy disks. Like anyone under 30 watching this now will be like, or anyone under 40, I suppose, watching this now will be like, what on earth are you going on about? Anyway, I had five and a half floppy disks. And I was looking for this other game to load up. And I ended up coming across my dad's journal. I shouldn't have read it. And I didn't really understand it. Like I said, I was only eight or nine years of age, but I had a read through of it. And I can still, it still sticks in my mind, this, this little paragraph he wrote. And he said, one of his biggest regrets in life was having a son, uh, which was obviously me. Um, and his reasonings for that was because he had such poor mental health. He just thought a son would automatically take his mind if that kind of makes sense. I know that's probably a bit narrow-minded, but he basically thought I'd have the same issues that he had. And at the time, I didn't I didn't get that. I didn't understand it. I just saw that, you know, one of the worst things that happened to me in my life was I had a son. So straight away, in my mind, rejection. And then I'm putting two and two together and getting five because, you know, I'd, I'd never felt that love from my dad. He obviously showed my sister a lot of love. He said in this journal he wished he'd had two daughters instead of a son and a daughter. And and that hit me quite hard. You know, I was probably old enough to, to understand it. But I never talked to him about it. I never asked him about it. I shut that journal up, put it in the drawer. And I suppose I, I suppressed it inside me. And I can remember reading that. And I, I, I've always been a chunky kid. I, I'm not saying, I think whether whether I'd had this big emotional trigger, and some of you, like I say, this is relative to me, it might not be relative to you, you guys might be like, well, that's not that bad, Neil. But to me at the time, it was, I found it quite tough. Um, and I kind of rejected my dad from that part. And, and from that point, we never had a close relationship. We never had a close relationship. Um, and emotionally, as it were, you know. And yeah, it... 
it, it was. It was. It was. It was tough to read, and I can remember from reading that. And like I say, I've always been a chunky kid. I've always enjoyed my food. I was always going to be a foodie. I was never going to be a skinny mini. I was probably always going to have a, some sort of weight issue. Um, but I remember going and being upset after reading that. I remember going and getting a load of biscuits and a big glass of milk, and just sitting there and eating these biscuits and drinking this milk. And I remember it made me feel better. It, for that interim second or however long I was eating these biscuits and milk for, I felt better. And from reading that, obviously it affected my mental health. And, and I don't think we ever realise how kids' mental health can be affected, but it did. And like I said, I suppressed it. I never talked about it. I never brought it up with my mum. I never talked to my dad about it. I never talked to anyone else about it. And the only time I've ever talked about it is when I sort of started doing like lives and, uh, you know, uh, doing kind of real lost boss stuff um, where I have, it's the first time I've really opened up about it. But in 2014, and, and like I say, once I started using food as that coping mechanism, then I, from that period in time, that's when I really started to gain weight. So obviously there's a correlation there. From re like I say, I've always been a chunky kid, but that is where I really started my weight to ramp up. And just as a as a point of reference, you know, when I started high school in 1992, I was the same size collar shirt then as I am now. So that kind of shows how much I weighed in 1992 as a kid. Um, and my obesity just went crazy. And obviously then when you're going through high school, you suffer with, you know, bullying, snide remarks. Um, I was never physically bullied, but mentally bullied, you know, just just little things. And again, I know it might sound, you know, it might sound daft to some people, but just things like always getting picked last for the footy team. And it might sound irrelevant or a bit trivial, but, you know, I knew that I got picked last for the football team because of my weight. You know, kids judge me on my weight. So, yeah, we're not going to pick him. Um, little things like that. Other things, like I used to have this, this the, the friends group I had at school. Because I was so overweight, I was very kind of defensive. And I never had what's called a best friend. I never wanted to get close to anyone. And I think that is, a, again, a, a, a bit of correlation from me not having a close relationship with my dad. I kind of, I've always been like that. And Rachel, my wife, now says that. I kind of, you know, sometimes I can be quite, you know, not very open and try and keep things at arm's length rather than opening up, certainly with certain emotions. And I never want to try and show weakness. So I had a friends group, but I never had like what I would class as a best friend really growing up. Um, and I remember this one kid who was overweight, but I think because he was overweight, but I was obviously a lot bigger than him. He kind of like targeted me to make himself feel better. And just little things like when it was lunchtime, the lunch bell, if we were at one side of the school, he'd always, we had like two or three canteens in the school I went to. He'd always want to go to the canteen for dinner that was furthest away and he'd want to run there. Why? Because he knew because of my weight, I couldn't keep up. And by the time I got there, I was probably six or seven or 10 kids back in the queue. And by the time this group of friends had got their food and was halfway through eating it, I was just getting served. And by the time I sit down to eat mine, they've pretty much finished and then they're off outside. So he kind of wanted to segregate me. And again, it was hard mentally. It, it, and I, I never opened up about it. Then obviously as growing, growing up through life, you struggle with other different things. And like I say, once I use food as that coping mechanism, I always use food as a coping mechanism. So when I had a bad day at school, I'd turn to food. And when you combine that with my mum, who was a, a, a pleaser and a feeder, right? So my mum always wanted to please. She's like that now. And in some ways, it's an amazing trait, right? She always wants to, to do good by you or thinks she's doing good by you. And but then, you know, I was she was very easy to manipulate. And, you know, I could get a lot out of her. And what I wanted out of her was lots of food, was takeaways, was crisps, was chocolate. And it was always readily available. And like I say, I was dragged to dietitians 10, 11 years of age, 10, maybe nine or 10. Uh, referred to the GP from my primary school and dragged to dietitians. And again, there was issues raised at high school because I was very overweight. Um, I don't actually, I can't, 
a pinpoint weight. But again, little things that struggled as a kid. You know, couldn't buy designer clothes. I couldn't fit in them. It wasn't like nowadays where some brands do up to four, five, six XL. You know, at the time, I couldn't buy it. So when all my mates were wearing the latest clobber, I couldn't do that. And again, you feel segregated and that's a negative emotion. You feel like a bit of an outcast. Again, that triggers emotional eating. Now, I can't really remember my weights. I remember weighing when I was about 21 and I think I was just under 30 stone. So obviously that shows, you know, and when I started my weight loss journey, I was 37 stone. So I reckon at high school, I was certainly 20 stone plus. I was certainly 20 stone plus. But, yep, yeah, I constantly used food as that coping mechanism. And as you go through life, when you have a bad day at work, when you have an argument with someone, when you get rejected because you're trying to chat to you know, in my case, trying to chat to girls and trying to have a relationship and you get rejected, you constantly turn to food. So if I was angry, I turned to food. If I was sad, I turned to food. Lonely, I turned to food. Bored, I turned to food. And that meant I was eating when I wasn't even hungry. I wasn't even thinking about what I was eating. And the knock-on effect of that is I end up being 37 stone. Why I've sort of gone through that with you guys there and is is because I um I think it's very important one of the reasons why a lot of us fail on our weight loss journeys is because we don't tackle the reason why we've ended up in this position in the first place. Yes, we might go to Slimming World Weight Watchers, you might work with me on my one to one plan and that is all those things are weight loss methods that are designed to change the way you eat and the amount of food you can consume, but that is irrelevant, and they'll and you'll never have any weight loss success, even working with me, unless you do go and tackle the reason why to kill the weeds. You know, I always use a, a bit of an analogy. You might have a dandelion in your in your garden or a weed in your garden. If you just keep chopping the head off that weed, it will keep coming back and keep coming back. And in some cases, it can come back worse. To kill the weed, you've got to kill the root. And that's the same with emotional eating. You'll never kill the root unless, you'll never kill the emotional eating unless you go to the root. And my root start, started at, at nine years of age. So how did I get back to that point in time? Well, my dad passed away in um, July 2013. And it was a massive, you know, it's one of my biggest regrets in life that I've never been able to talk to him about this. And I don't know if I had managed to talk to him about this, whether it would have got us anywhere. It might have been worse. I, I don't know. But yeah, my dad, he was diagnosed in April 2013 with renal cancer and um, literally 13 weeks later, he passed away. Uh, and it was the only time, this is where I do get emotional. I'm not going to. It was the only time he ever told me he loved me or a, a time that I can actually remember was when he was in hospital. He probably three, four weeks before he passed away. And it was the first time. And it was tough, you know, I find it even now. And obviously, because he's been taken away from me, I can't raise these things with him. But to take a positive out of a negative, which is part of me sorting out my emotional eating and part of me managing to move on and lose this weight, I think if my dad had still been here, I wouldn't have lost this weight. I don't think I'd have been here now, if I'm being honest with you. So, you know, like I say, to take a positive out of, out of a negative. But when he told me that in hospital, probably two or three weeks before he passed away, it kind of did trigger something. And what it did trigger in me was a lot of guilt and a lot of regret that I hadn't talked to him more. And once he's gone, he's gone. So I didn't have that option. Following his death, I went on a six-month bender. Uh, uh, and, and you know, I wasn't working at the time. I'd been made redundant a few months previous to my dad falling ill. I was living off my redundancy money, and then I went on a six-month bender. And that was just before I started my weight loss journey. I started my, you know, I had a little bit, of, I've, I have spoke about it before. I might go into a bit more detail. I had a bit of an epiphany in December 2013. And um, 
and, and I started my weight loss journey February 2014. So about eight months after, my, seven months after my dad passed away. And uh, um, part of me uh, healing, you know, I went to the doctors in November 2013 and I spoke to them about it. I was having some thoughts in my mind where, again, I'll be totally honest with you, I didn't want to be here anymore. Uh, and, you know, uh, and they recommended me going for some therapy. We'll put you on the list. We'll, you know, but there's a 12 month waiting list. So I went and I went and had some counseling myself, I paid for it privately and I went and did it. And I went for a couple of sessions and I just, I couldn't open up. I, I just clambered up. It was pointless. December 2013, I don't want to go into too much detail because I don't want it to trigger anyone, but I made the conscious decision that I didn't want to be on this planet anymore and I put things into place to make sure I wasn't here anymore. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously things didn't quite work out the way I was planning and I'm glad now that they didn't work out the way I was planning. And from that, that was kind of the epiphany moment where, right, you need to sort yourself out. I went back to therapy in, in the January uh, 2014 and I did manage to open up. It kind of made me realise I did want to be here and if I'm going to be here, I need to sort, I can't carry on living the way I'm living. I need to sort my life out. And I went to therapy and I only went for about six or eight sessions and, you know, the therapist, you know, was the one that made me think the way I was thinking. Now, I'm not saying I'm a psychologist. I'm not saying I'm a therapist or anything like that. But he made me delve back in time uh, and, and you know, go to this pinpoint moment, you know. And he sort of said, when did you, you know, when did you start noticing that you were gaining all this weight? And I said, I'd probably be about nine, ten years of age. He said, right, so what happened then? Why did you start overeating then? And that's, you know, it took a lot for me to accept it. And, you know... Once I kind of opened up, it then allowed me to digest it. And he saw, you know, lots of things he said to me, just because your dad didn't show you emotion and just because your dad wrote in a journal, it, it was actually, you know, he made me realise that he wrote in a journal that the worst day of my life was then I had a son because he, I, I, I have fear that he was going to end up like me. He said, that's a protection thing. He said, that's not a negative in the sense that you took it that he wishes you were never born. It's a thing like he just never wants anyone, any of his children to go through the mental torture that he's going through. And that's uh, and the fact that he thought that I might have gone through the same mental torture throughout my life that he went through. That's why he wished he didn't have it because he just kind of maybe a little bit not sexist. But, you know, obviously uh, a boy might take on his traits and his daughter might take on my mum's traits, you know, and it just doesn't work like that. It actually so happens. If I'm going to be totally honest, my sister has took on my dad's traits and I've took on my mum's traits, which is probably why we don't talk anymore, but that's maybe for a different podcast. Anyway, managing to digest that and understanding that, it kind of literally felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. And it's amazing how... 25 years of abusing my body through food was literally dissected and digested in my own mind within a few weeks. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you can do that. It can take years to sort out emotional issues. But at the time, I was in a really good frame of mind. I'd sort of like to say, I don't know if that's the right word, but I'd had this epiphany that I did want to be here and I did want to live a life and I did, and and, and I was quite positive. Uh, I weaned myself off, uh, again, I don't recommend doing this, but I kind of weaned myself off my sertraline um, that I was taking. I've been, I've been on and off uh, sertraline from being 19 years of age. I, I was quite manic depressive. Got tested loads for bipolar, the same as my dad. And they, they could never get to the bottom of my kind of depression or, or anxiety. I, I, I kind of look back now and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely thinking I'm ADHD, reading more into it because my mind just works 10 times faster at times than it should do. And I, you might notice from, if you tune into any of my lives or I probably do it on my podcast without realising it, I, you know, I can go off on tangents very, very easily. Am I doing one now? Maybe I am. But anyway, you know, so maybe that was a case of, uh, of it. And literally just 
sertraline. And sertraline is for anxiety more than anything. Um, and I never ever felt like an anxious person. I don't really feel like, I've never felt like an anxious person. Anyway, getting to that root and understanding and getting it in my mind then did allow me to, like I say, open up uh, in my own mind uh, and start digesting a lot of things and start understanding a lot of things. And straight away, it took away sometimes that need, that anger inside me, that, so, that pent up thing that's obviously been bottled up for years and years and years. Kind of like when you, you know, knock the cork maybe off a champagne bottle and it just, it's sort of like if you shake it, if you, or a Coke bottle, a bit bougie that talking about, not boozy, bougie talking about uh, champagne, but um, can't stand the stuff. Uh, but, you know, if you take a, like a 500 ml Coke bottle and you shake it and you look at it, it's violent inside. And as soon as you take off the lid, it kind of spurts everywhere. But then what's left in the bottle is, nice and calm and that's how my body felt and you know uh, that allowed me to like I say get more in control of my emotions one thing we have to understand about negative you're always going to have them in your life you can't get rid of them you can't eradicate them you're always going to have the odd day at work that's stressful you're always going to have time where you're worried about loved ones you're always going to have times where you're a little bit angry but if, you know, when you have these emotions permanently in your body, and I had them in my body for 20 odd years, you know, we have two hormones. It doesn't quite work as, as simple as this, but we have two hormones. We have cortisol, we have serotonin. Cortisol is the hormone that leads to anxiety and depression and anger and all, all negative. So let's take cortisol as a negative hormone. And then we have serotonin, which is kind of labeled the happy hormone. It's the one that makes you feel good about yourself. And if you've got pent up negative emotion, what that will do is it will drive up your cortisol levels and drive down your serotonin levels. And if cortisol is going to sit high in your body permanently, you are always going to need a coping mechanism to try and get rid of that pent up whatever it is. Like I say, it could be it could be all sorts: jealousy, anger, loneliness, tiredness, you know, um, uh, anxiety, depression, all those things. It could be anything. Fear it could be anything, right? It could be a culmination of all those things. Is that the right word? Culmination, combination, a combination, culmination, combination of all those things, right? It, 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 it could be. And the serotonin, your happy hormones, and that's kind of what antidepressants do. What they try and do is they try and bring balance to the force if I'm going to be a Star Wars geek antidepressants will never sort out anything that you if you're depressed you have to sort out your depression by making sure your serotonin levels these happy hormones kind of kick the cortisol hormones into touch uh, and if you're not willing to do that you'll never sort out what's going on in your mind and that's what I did I I, I sort of managed to put things into place that made me a happier person um, so what did I do? What what did I do? So I, I I I kind of killed the root in that way by understanding what my pinpoint position was in time that triggered this you know need to use food as my coping mechanism, um, and then I looked at things that dragged me down in life. Things that you know one was alcohol. So I was dependent on food massively, a little bit dependent on alcohol, and I really cut down my drinking. That again. You know, alcohol, abusing alcohol will raise cortisol levels, will drop serotonin. So I really cut down. I didn't cut it out. I just really cut it down and got it under control. Um, what other things, you know, um, I did things naturally that make serotonin levels uh, rise. Eat healthier. Obviously, when you're on a weight loss journey, you naturally eat healthier anyway. But I ate healthier and that naturally raises serotonin. I introduced regular movement into my life, going for a daily walk, that will naturally raise serotonin. Start doing regular exercise, that naturally raises that serotonin hormone and, you know, pushes down that cortisol hormone. Um, I did a job that I hated. I was very stuck in, I did sales from 2003 to 2012 when I got made redundant and I hated it. I did various types of sales and I just didn't like it. I didn't like the pressure, but uh, it was the only job I felt I could do at the size I was. So I was trapped. And, you know, when I, um, 
when I kind of got this newfound love for life, I'd all, my dad was a chartered accountant. He had his own little practice. He used to work for a company as well, but he had his own little practice. And I did loads of bookkeeping for him. Um, so I kind of knew the ins and outs of accountancy, but never did any qualifications. And I went to night school and I did my AATs, level two, three, and four in accounting and became an accountant. And I never would have had the confidence to do that. That then led me on to doing a job that I actually really enjoyed. I don't know why numbers just work in my mind and I quite enjoy working with them. Don't go wrong, being an accountant is the most boring thing in the world. Uh, but for me, I just like, I, I quite like it. I like, you know, I run my whole real loss boss on spreadsheets. They just It just kind of works with me. And I actually started doing a job that I enjoyed. And in 2018, I started working part-time as a personal trainer, full-time as a personal trainer in 2019, and did a job that I really enjoyed then through COVID and adapting, I became an online weight loss coach in 2021. And now I do a job that I love. And again, doing a job that I enjoy. It doesn't mean some days are stressful, some days are busy, some days I'm very tired. But the overall emotion is I love my job. And that keeps the, ser the cortisol levels high and the, ser uh, the cortisol levels low and the serotonin high. Um, I was always, again, a bit of a defense mechanism. I didn't like conflict because... Anytime I had conflict, they used my weight against me. And again, I was very sort of caged in. So um, if there was ever conflict in my life, I, I kind of shied away from it. Now I hit it head on. I don't mean I hit it. I'm not a violent person, but, you know, I face it, I face it head on. If, if anything's bothering me, I message people or if I feel... You know, some people get what they call beer fear. I don't get beer fear. I just own it. You know, if I went out the night before and got quite drunk and this, that, and the other, I don't care. And if I feel like I've possibly upset someone, if I wake up, oh, God, what did I say? I'll message him. Did I, did I say anything last night? I can't remember. I did it. The last time I did this was um, I went out before Christmas and I got rather stupidly drunk. Right. And, I, and it's the last time I actually got drunk. And, and I never want to drink like that again. It was one of those things. I got quite stupidly drunk um, and I can't remember leaving the pub and a few days later I went in and, and normally if if I can't re if I couldn't remember Lee, I wouldn't go out again for a few weeks and I'd be like oh god and I'd be scared of what would be popping up on Facebook because I've done some dodgy things in my not dodgy things but I've done some embarrassing things in my time and again if they came up now you know on Facebook I wouldn't care I wouldn't care I'd own it I'm not bothered don't bother me whatsoever Right, I've done some bad things in my time because of what I was going through at the time. And I mean some stupid things, some embarrassing things. Again, nowadays, I don't, I don't care. But I remember going out and a couple of days later, I went to the pub uh, or I saw the barmaid that was at the pub uh, at the corner shop and I went, God, I was hammered on Sunday. If I did anything, I'm really sorry. Uh, and she was like, no, you were, you were a delight, to be honest with you. You just stumbled off. I was like, all right, perfect. That's really, really good. Whereas normally, if I'd seen her, I'd have been like walking the other way, hat down. Like, I'm talking Neil from 10 years ago. Um, I've, I, I always think things, someone commented on my Instagram the other day saying, just love how positive you are all the time. And I'm just like, life's too short not to be. Life's too short not to be positive all the time. You know, I, I, I always think now, whatever's going on in my life, there's always someone worse off than me, you know? So again, I do always try and, you know, be a positive person, think positive. Um, and it's just a good way to be. The glass is always half full. It's not half empty. And for most of my life, I sat in this negative mindset and now I want to sit in this positive mindset. And what's the knock-on effect of now doing a job that I love or changing my careers, even though I wasn't brave enough to, but I did when I started my weight loss journey, always seeing things quite positive, eating healthy on a regular basis, doing exercise, going out for a daily walk, um, you know, tackling things as they happen, looking back in time and tackling, killing that route. The, the 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 overall effect of that is I can just cope with everything so much better to the point where I don't need a coping mechanism or, uh, you know, the coping mechanisms I have now are a lot more healthier. You know, when I first started my weight loss journey and, you know, I did have days that I struggled. I'm not saying I didn't and I did have times and I used to, I actually ended up, although I was working as an accountant, it was a very stressful job because I was running a domiciliary care agency. You know, when days that didn't go great or days I was stressed, 
instead of going home and eating my emotions, I used to go to the gym and train. And it honestly, it just makes you feel out of this world. It, and, I, and I don't mean that like, oh, it's, you know, I'm not trying to say it's an out of body experience. I'm just saying it does. You don't know how going and doing a really, when you're stressed and you've got a bit of something pent up in you and you go and chuck some weights around a gym or go and cycle on a bike and give it your all and you end up, you know, it just kind of takes it all away. And exercise is proven again to raise serotonin and drop those cortisol levels. So basically what I've done is I've changed my life. And we always say weight loss is about lifestyle change. But the way I've changed my life now allows me to handle emotions. And I don't have permanent anger in my life. I don't have permanent stress in my life. I don't have permanent fear in my life. I don't have permanent loneliness in my life. I, and I, I don't, you know, I, I've, and I'm not saying like I say, do I have days where I get stressed? Of course I do. Do I have things that sometimes make me angry? Of course I do. Do I sometimes have a little bit of worry? Oh, what happens if this goes wrong? You know, looking, you know, when I decided to retire from being a, per when I decided to quit my job in 2018, which was a, a, a good paid job to then set up my own personal training business. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm like, four years ago, Neil, you weighed 37 stone and you struggled to get out of bed. And now you're giving up your job to train other people in a gym and teach them how to exercise. It just shouldn't be happening. But I just went and did it. And I was like, do you know what? What's the worst that can happen? I'll either beg for my old job back or I'll apply for a different job or I'll go and work doing something. And that's kind of the way I feel now. When I gave up personal training to do the Real Lost Boss online full time, you know, again, it was a fear of the unknown. It was, what am I, what am I doing here? What happens if my TikTok gets banned? Or what happens if my social media gets banned? Or what happens if people just, the next person comes along and people just stop following me or stop liking me? Or why? You know, those things. Go, and, and in my mind, it's like, so what? If that's what happens, that's what happens, Neil. You can't change what's going to happen tomorrow. You can't change what happened yesterday. You can't change what happened in the past. And, and you know, what will be, will be. And if anything, if things go wrong, you just tackle it at the time. And that's kind of the way I live my life. And, you know, we're all individuals. I'm not, like I say, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, you know, a therapist or anything like that. I understand obesity because I've been there. And I understand mental health issues because I've been there. And, you know, what has sorted me out, I'm not saying it will sort you out in, in a way, but I'm hoping you take maybe some inspiration from what I'm saying. And you're like, do you know what? I am going to look back in the past and, you know, what was the pivotal point of when I gained my weight? And, you know, is there an issue? Is there an underlying issue? Do I need to tackle this? Do I need to change that? Because you all can change. You all can. Anyone can change. I, I always say this, I, I truly believe that obesity is a mental health issue. And the good thing about mental health is it can improve. It can, and I know some people don't get a grasp of it, unfortunately, and some people can't bring themselves, but it can change. Things can change. You've just got to want to do that. So how are you going to sort your emotional eating? Number one, you're gonna, you need to accept you've got a problem. Before you can fix any problem, you need to accept you've got one, right? And I'm not saying your emotional eating trigger or why you started using food as this coping mechanism uh, uh, and you use it as a distraction, as something that for whatever reason, but you have to accept that that is the reason, if it is, right? You then need to look back and go, is there, a, is there this pivot in time where... I really started to gain weight. And it could be anything. For me, it was a little bit of childhood trauma that I felt was childhood trauma. Like I say, whether that is whether you felt it deserved enough to trigger overeating, it is down to you. But it could be a time where you had an abusive relationship. And, it, and do you know what? You're going to have to answer some questions you might not want to answer. I'm going to be honest with you there. You, re, you might have to. Right? I'm, I'm not saying that. You might have to get deep and it might be really painful at times. I've been through a lot. But when you come out the other side, it's all worth it. So it might be down to it might be down to childhood trauma. It might be down to an abusive relationship in the past. It might be down to something, you know. It might be down to 
when you started having children and your life changed and you might have gone through, you know, if you're female, uh, postnatal depression, you know, it, it, because it's how much it's changed your life. You've struggled to bond with your children. It might be down to relationships you have with parents. It might be down to relationships you currently have with your children. It, it could be anything. It could be the fact that you just... A bit like I, you know, when I when I look back pre twenty fourteen, I just existed. I didn't live, and like I say, there was a combination of factors that made me unhappy: my weight, what I did for a living, my circumstance, my relationship with, in a way, both my parents. And like I say, I'm not trying to say I had a bad relationship, and I love my mum to bits, and she's always done the best for me, but her thinking she was doing the best for me was actually contributing to my weight issue. And, you know, do I blame my mum? Yes and no. In the 80s, there wasn't the education there is now. There wasn't. But at the end of the day, until kids are 16 years of age, their responsibility is with the parent or the legal guardian. And as the parent or the legal guardian, it is their responsibility to show them the path of the right way that's what we do you know and that's the same with anything you look in nature you know uh, you know parent adult birds show the babies how to hunt how or you know adult lions show the the cubs how to hunt parent birds show them how to get food it, it's what we do we learn from our parents um obviously nowadays we learn from social media and we learn from youtube and we learn from this that and the other but yeah you know it is so to cure your emotional eating it might be you have to get a bit deep you have to look at the root you have to look at the triggers you have to look at what's going on i think another big thing of emotional eating is i always say this there's good reason and poor excuse and i used to use you know like i say a little bit of stress at work in a day is not a good reason to emotionally eat but will make it a good reason you know, I used to use anything as an excuse to hit the chocolate, to hit the ice cream, to hit the biscuits, to hit the crisps. And that's something I've accepted now. I've accepted that although I've put things into my everyday life that helps me cope with life a lot better, that has, has you know, suppressed my emotional eating, it doesn't mean that I don't, you can't, like I say, eradicate stress or anger or fear or whatever. You can't eradicate negative emotion, but you can dumb it down enough to not have to have this permanent coping mechanism. I truly believe that. I also believe, again, not to put too much pressure on me, sometimes, you know, kind of a little bit of emotional uh, responses where you turn to food, is that still going to happen? Yeah, it's still, sometimes I say to Rachel, do you know what, I just need a hug from food. I say, not a lot loads, but sometimes I just fancy a McDonald's or I just fancy a pizza. And again, I've, you know, I don't let that, whereas before it was that vicious circle. I eat because I'm unhappy and I'm unhappy because I eat. And it was like, oh, I'm unhappy. I have a McDonald's. Now I'm unhappy because I've eaten my... I don't feel like that anymore. If I do need that little hug from food, right, sometimes I have it and it's not an issue unless it becomes a permanent hug. You know, if, it, if food's constantly giving me that bear hug everywhere I go. So again, you know, I always, I think I used this on a, on a TikTok recently. You know, I watched an old episode of Friends and Rachel had had an argument with Ross and she come in and obviously Rachel didn't have a weight issue, Monica didn't have a weight issue. But because of that, they both got on the couch with a tub of ice cream, with a couple of spoons, putting the worlds to rights, saying how much of a prat Ross was. Right. And again, that is, it is kind of natural. You know, it's a little bit natural, you know, and again, I'm not going to, I don't, if you try and be perfect, you'll be very imperfect. If that makes sense. You know, so I'm not trying to justify emotional eating, but it doesn't mean it will totally be eradicated. It's about having that control. It's about having that control. And every time, you know, your kid, you have an argument with your kids or your partner or something, you turn, you don't need to. Every time I say you have a bit of stress at work, you don't need to. Every time something makes you a little bit angry for whatever reason, you don't need to have, or you shouldn't have that constant need to use a coping mechanism. And once you get to that point, you have, you've got on top of your emotional eating. But like I say, just be aware, you can't eradicate negative emotion. And every now and then, you're going to emotionally eat. Just like every now and then, you know, you have a tough week at work and you just go for a couple of beers. Going for a couple of beers after a tough week at work won't cause you any issues unless those two beers turn into 20 pints and you end up in a right mess. All right? 
There we go. I think that's about it. I think I've waffled on for long enough. So, you know, like I say, I'm hoping you've took something out of that. And if you are currently struggling with emotional eating, I hope there's a little bit in that podcast that's uh, no pun intended that will give you a little bit of food for thought to try and work on. And it might be a case if you need therapy to get over it. It might be a case if you need to open up. It might be a case if you need to, to change some big things in your life to sort this emotional eating out. Might be some big things, like I say, things that you've swept under the carpet that you don't want to address. You need to address them and you need to get at them. But if you don't, and that constant need to emotionally eat, even if you suppress it for three, six, 12 months, it will keep coming back and haunt you or, or haunting you unless you proper get it under control. And I think for many, many people, it's one of the big reasons why they fail on their weight loss journey because they don't work at that. Uh, and I also think it's a big reason why people sort of relapse, lose lots of weight, go back to it. I'm not saying there's other factors, of course there are, but I think emotional eating is a biggie. And so far, touch wood, I've kept mine under control. And I think if I keep my lifestyle the way it is, the way I live my life, the way I have my mindset, I, I don't see any reason why it won't stay under control for, fingers crossed, the rest of my life. Anyway, there we go. Those are all my thoughts on how you could hopefully try to get that emotional eating under control. As always, guys, I have no idea what platform you're watching this on, but please, if you give it a like, give it a subscribe, mention in a comment. If you want to ask me any questions, I'll try and get back to them and, and reply to them. Uh, if you need help, with your your weight loss uh i am a one-to-one -one weight loss coach and i am probably i would say the most cost effective one-to-one -one works because i want it accessible to everyone whatever your current financial situation i want to help you with your weight loss journey if you're struggling so um get on board with one of my one-to-one -one plans if you just feel like you want a little support network i also have a community that you can subscribe to if you come onto my one-to-one -one plan you get the community is part of that, but you can just subscribe to the community as a standalone thing as well. Again, I'll put all the links in the description and in the comments and um, yeah, there we go. Until next time, I hope that's helped you boss your weight loss. <laughs>